Hey, everybody. Um, thanks so much for joining Archaeology Southwest for another installment of Archaeology Cafe. Um, and this one tonight is with Jim Eno, as you know. Um, he is one of my favorite human beings for a number of different reasons. Uh, Jim is a world traveler, lifelong learner, really fascinating guy um, who I first met back in 2011 and 2012. Um, at the standing on the plaza at Pueblo Benito, where we were doing live television broadcasts to school kids all over North America. We did four shows a day for two days. It was exhausting. It was cold. It was informative. It was fantastic. But I got to, to um, learn from Jim, listen to Jim, um, think about the world according to Jim, and so on. And it was a priceless experience for me, one that I never forgot. And the takeaway phrase for me from that was, there are many ways of knowing. And it's a succinct way of just communicating um, uh, what perspective Jim brings to all of the, the topics that he touches. And this is where it gets really fascinating, because in some ways the guy needs no introduction. You can go on to the, the Internet and type in his name and you're going to find out all kinds of fascinating things about Jim Eno. Um, and so what I did is went to Facebook and Jim and I have been Facebook friends for a really long time. And he's one of my favorite Facebook posters because, and I'm going to share with you the, the previous four posts that he put up all within the last month had to do, sorry, Jim, I told you I was going to do it. The last four posts that he put on Facebook were the fact that the Turkey vultures arrived two weeks early this year. His March Madness bracket was up there, edited and changed and everything else. I don't know if you want any money off of that, but, you know, it's good to know that you're a gambler in, in small amounts and so on. Then there was a photograph from an airport somewhere in which a guy who's not pleased to be standing there is standing there with a sign that says, His Excellency Jim Eno. <laughs> and Jim's comment to this was, they could have hired a more enthusiastic driver because this guy is just the manifestation of ennui. It's a really hilarious photograph. And then finally, um, from about the start of March, is a, a vignette that uh, about the first time that Jim saw Led Zeppelin live, which we just confirmed was the Los Angeles Forum in 1973 when tickets were $8 uh, for the floor seats. It was a bygone era. Um, tonight's presentation that Jim is going to do is called A Lifelong Zuni Farmer's Authority and Influence. Um, and I think that what you're going to get out of this series of vignettes, series of discussions that, that Jim is going to lead us through is a reckoning that in many of the digital technologies that we use, except this one tonight, of course, we've lost some of the art of true storytelling, of listening to each other, hearing, feeling what people are truly saying. And we've lost a little bit of that wanderlust. And there were many days where Jim was hitchhiking around the country. And Jim, I think you got to write a book about all of that, but I'll stop there. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Eno. Welcome, Jim. Um, well, thank you, Steve. That was, uh, that was a really nice introduction. You, you can't believe everything, right? Steve says, but regardless, thanks. Thanks so much. And it's a pleasure to be here. So I, I suggested, I said really uh, that I would talk about a lifelong Zuni farmer's authority and influence. And you might think that's that's a that's a bold title, but also may not realize that I wasn't referring only to myself. So really, the, the, does a, a farmer's authority and influence matter? And I think it does. In this astonishing digital age, as Steve was referring to, of instantaneous communications, uh, GPS and barcodes, uh, identity profiling, uh, unbridled false information, and rapidly evolving artificial intelligence, yes, I think it does matter what a farmer's authority and influence is. And I am not being entirely negative about digitization. Uh, in fact, it's really more about being brave in the way we approach new knowledge systems. Uh, I believe I, I am a reflection of at least 600 generations of agriculturalists. I'll let you archaeologists figure that out. Is it 600 generations? How many generations do you think it is? Uh, and I believe in in spite of the thousands of years 
uh, well, being amongst those who came before me, I, I still have a lot in common with the farmers who tilled soil with a dasaquin, a planting stick. And if all goes well, this spring will be my 67th consecutive year planting. So as an infant still tied to a cradle board, uh, my, my aunties and grandma put seeds in my little baby hand and I was held over a hole and dropped them into a, a hole. And as a toddler helped out in the fields, maybe I got in the way. And many years later, after high school, I went hitchhiking for, for two years and all throughout the West, uh, never east of Denver or Albuquerque, but throughout the West, as I was hitchhiking, I was, I was planting something. And then at university, finally, when I did go, uh, I planted cilantro and chili and onions outside the dorm. And after university, returned home to the family field and still planting. So 67 consecutive years. So. You, you might not even call what I do is farming. Uh, I don't know, maybe you know, in Zuni we say, uh, we are ashwitoyanakwe. We are just, we are planters, right? So I don't know, maybe a practitioner of purpose is a better fit. And I, I should start too and also say, I, I am not a Zuni expert, even though I am enrolled as Zuni tribal member. I live here in Zuni, in my hometown. I still live here. And yeah, for better or worse, that that's a good thing. I mean, it does make me the family bail bondsman, loan shark, chauffeur sometimes, but it it's still, uh, it's the right place to be for me. I'm also not a Zuni religious leader, but maybe I am sort of a energetic and mad hatter savant. I don't know. Well, growing up, I, I was I was like almost any other kid, you know, learning from plenty of mistakes and learning how to fit in with my peers. But when I was about eight years old, I fell out of the back of our family's pickup truck when it was moving at a pretty high speed. I remember the ground coming to me fast. Uh, I was knocked unconscious, and there was darkness, from what I remember, darkness, still, still. And I wasn't sure if I was a star, a rock, a sound, but I knew something was wrong. So inside this darkness, this uncertainty, totally unknowing, I could sense that something was wrong. And there began a kind of a systems check. Whatever I was, I didn't even know what I was. Slowly, I began to understand and feel that maybe I have some kind of extensions. Whatever I am, I have extensions, maybe maybe limbs, I think. Then things started speeding up, kind of like rebooting. And, and there was some light, that little, little bit of light that some people talk about. It was coming and faintly, but then it went away and became dark again. And then there was a beat. Things were speeding up a little bit. There was a beat. I'm not sure where that was coming from, but there was a beat. And then some light, and then eventually, slowly, some color. And I began to understand that I am something, something with limbs. And then there was a voice, and I heard someone say, he's moving. Well, Weeks, and I think maybe years after that, I would have flashback moments to some phenomenal memories. One time I was, I was eating at the table with my family, aunties, cousins, uncles, grandparents. And I, I, I was an adult, and this was maybe my, my 40s, but um, 
I was eating my beans and we were just talking about things from a long time ago. And I said, I remember when I was really small, seeing some lines above me. And I saw shadows moving back and forth and some, some chanting, some sounds. And, and my, my aunties and my, my mom and grandma had to put their, put their spoons down and they looked at me, they put their onions down and they looked at me. They said, you know what that probably was? That was when we were hosting Shotloko here at the house. And they said, you were still tied to a cradle board. You were just a few months old. And you remember that? So something jarred in my head that brought back these phenomenal memories. And there was another one that um, I may have been two or three years old. And that was being with my mother and seeing my mother with tears running down her cheeks. I was looking up at her and uh, she, she was squeezing my hand. And so I, I told my mother this memory and she said, you remember that? And I said, yeah. She said, yeah, I think you were maybe three years old. That was when we were visiting your father when uh, he was serving in the Air Force. And we had encountered a whites only public restroom. But I remember that. So I think something happened there. I, I, I was rewired and uh, maybe I developed a new kind of pattern language. I just see and feel things differently than I, I think some people do. Uh, I think we all have had actuated a kind of switch somewhere in our roads of life. Maybe they were emotional, maybe physical. Um, so let me, let me tell you a little bit about my family too. I, I am a corn clan from my mother. Um, my mother's side is Tewa. And my father's side is Zuni. So you may know my grandmother, uh, Nampeo. Um, my grandmother was Nampeo's granddaughter. So the, I, I guess I was Nampeo's uh, great, great uh, grandson. And I can feel that. I can feel that creative gene. On my dad's side, my great grandfather's name was Inote. Uh, that means a long time ago. So sometimes my friends call me old school. They say, You're so old school. And they just call me Inote. Or as some friends also call me uh, Kolatlan, which is a big chili. So you know, a nickname. So of course, both my families were farmers. My my great grandparents passed away when I was seventeen, so I was raised in part by those people who live a significant part of their lives in the eighteen hundreds, and they told me what their great grandparents told them. Yeah, I, I think that's it's really interesting when I think, wow. You know, some people, I, I thought this initially, but it's I learned quickly that, that they are very clever people. I mean, there were things like they understood how photography works. You know, there's this romantic notion that uh, Native people, especially then, were just uh, amazed with the magic of these kind of things. But my grand, my great-grandparents told me, yeah, they, they got the idea. It was kind of mixtures of, of things and solutions and created an impression on a plate or paper. So they got it. Uh, they, I think they also adapted to new mechanisms for information processing without a written script and certain other tools. And, and I think that's really cool when you think about it. Well, so let's let's also be clear about labels. I, I think we can all agree. There are good artists, and then there are great artists. There are some good carpenters out there, and there are some great carpenters out there. There are good musicians and great musicians, and good farmers, and I think great, well-practiced ones. Uh, 
I, I, I can't say I'm a great farmer, but I have certainly got a lot of practice. Um, I, I believe that really outstanding farmers are pragmatic, principled, and righteous. And often, without numbers, farmers, like I remember my grandparents, great-grandparents, farmers would calculate and consider proportions and the economy of labor. And I know that as farmers, we're always chasing day daylight. You know, we're, we, we always seek efficiency. And maybe the first engineers were, were ag engineers. And, you know, I thought it was interesting too. Here's something my, my great grandfather was, was always perplexed that some people were adamant about irrigating in straight rows. I remember him talking about that. And he, he would say that, you know, when, when he was really little, that when he said that when we irrigated from a spring, or from some rain runoff, we watch the water first. And wherever the water went, that's where we planted. And that the water never went in a straight line. That was that just made sense. I thought, yeah, that's right. So I also know that life can be hard enough. You know, we we feel many things as farmers, and we we seek harmony and some tranquility. We become anxious, but accepting of insects, weather, temperatures. We, we are accepting of the natural crescendos and spikes of nature. We surrender to it, and that allows some peace. We talk to our plants like they are children. We care deeply about them, and that makes us more attentive and careful growers. When I asked my great-grandmother about people and villages, because we would go, well, my, my mother's side of the family was at First Mesa, at, at uh, the Hopi Reservation, but we would go up and down the Rio Grande and visit friends there too. But I'd ask my great-grandmother why why was it that some of the same people had separate villages? Why not one big villages? You know, or even like Mesa Verde or Chaco Canyon. And she said, so they can get along better. That sometimes people just need space. I think another thing about my family elders, these, these amazing farmers, they were also not na naive. They were not exploitable. They, they often paused and looked sideways at, at comments that they th thought didn't make sense. You know, they, they were not easily swayed. They were, they were very critical thinkers and careful thinkers. So I'm thinking about, too, about some, some things in the past, all additive, uh, making up who I am. But I, I remember my grandfather and I were, were out getting firewood, and our, our truck got stuck in some mud and this is the winter time right and we got stuck we, there was no way of getting out it was getting dark and cold and we decided quickly that that the best thing to do was to walk to the nearest highway which was about 12 miles away and it became cloudy i mean it, it was already starting to get cloudy as the sun was setting so we knew that it was going to get dark and it became pitch black. We couldn't even see our hand in front of our face. And my grandpa said, don't worry, we'll, we'll be okay. Don't worry. And he also knew the road that we were on. He knew it before it was even a road. He knew it when it was a trail. And he was very clear in his mind about our path, even in complete darkness. We would walk through, walk. I remember we'd say, he'd say, we're going uphill now. Oh, we're going downhill now. So there's going to be a fork here. So we'll need to stay to the right or move to the left. And that got me to think about later that my two favorite ideas and words are, one is hope 
and the other is clarity. He was very clear about where we were going. I also want to say that during my career, uh, I was also a natural resource director at Zuni. I had a great team, and there were occasionally some visiting scholars that uh, I respected a lot. And I remember there was a, a farmer study where I think the folks were from Iowa State, good folks. And we were basically was a, a study with some Zuni farmers about soil knowledge and about plants. And I remember sitting down at the table and said, let's catch up. How are things going? And laid out their binders that things are going great. And Here's, here's this study of how, what we did with corn, and here, here are these plants that are being collected and the soil names and so on. And they said, this is a great ethnobotanical piece here. And I asked the Zunis, um, how's it going? And they, basically they said, that it's, it's going okay, but uh, uh, these folks don't understand Zuni, so it's, that's been a challenge. But I had a moment there, this, this, this awakening, this kind of moment of clarity and I thought, you know, I, I've always tried to bring science and Zoni traditional knowledge together, that somehow we can bring them together. But this moment made me think that I think what we did was we subjugated that traditional knowledge to an ethnoscience. And while I would uh, never disparage the sciences, I, I, I'm trained as a scientist myself from, from university. But, but science is one sphere of knowledge, and I think Zuni or other native traditional knowledge is another knowledge system. And I think our challenge now is not how necessarily how we bring them together, but how we learn across knowledge systems, which means our next challenge really is how we mediate knowledges, plural. Now, Here's some reflection. Uh, where I am in my life, it's it's a good life. I think that in the spring of my life, I was exposed to many wonders and, and joys. You know, my my family's art, this really exceptional humor and, and laughter, but also some injustice. That was in the springtime of my life. I think in the summer of my life, I went hitchhiking for a couple of years. I, I, I knew I had a home, but I was on some great adventure, I thought. And my, one of my grandmothers also told me that just go out, meet new people, learn new things. So I did. I left soon in the end. Got out to Flagstaff, ended up near Truxton, Arizona, somewhere out in the desert. I spent the first night, and I got kind of nervous and scared, and I thought I better go back home the next day. But I, I, I decided the next day I would just keep going, and yeah, slept under bridges and in the bushes, wherever, and found the work wherever I was going, and it was quite an adventure. I then went to college. I flunked out. I wasn't prepared, but I returned as an A student. Uh, I had some help, but I returned. I did well. Then I returned to Zuni, uh, and in some ways I thrived, but I also struggled because I was different. And my struggles made me think that when I see people on the streets, maybe they are struggling or other situations where you see people and others might say that they were bad. But I, I think really we live in a world with, with damaged people. So that was in the summer of my life. Some things I learned in the autumn of my life. I think I am ripening into a deeper purpose. How can I create the greatest amount out of influence with the least amount of effort. Well, some of that is creating structure, right? Structure, 
It actually gives me freedom so I can create more influence. Also, I, I accepted myself. I know I am unorthodox. I'm off-center and maybe an enigma to many. And I'm not yet in the, the winter of my life, but I watch my parents and I see that I will be like them in 20 years. They struggle physically. They struggle with their words mentally. And that tells me that I don't want to waste any time. The maybe in the winter of my life, it will be a time to see some new visions. So what does all this mean with regard to a lifelong former's authority and influence? And, and not just me. Well, as we were saying, the world today is, is deeply concerned about our vulnerability to human-caused and natural disasters, such as food security, and, and other things related to being on a precipice. We, we see increasing divisiveness even among ideological camps and a flowing tightness and looseness of people. And we ask, what, what can be done? Well, I think environmental influences from living in the same place through older age is important. Add to that an enduring cultural setting I have watched a familiar sandstone cliff change shape through the winds and the sands. I have become saddened with the drying springs and joyful when I find solutions to droughts. I've seen modest free from vanity leadership become a stage for elitism and power. And yes, even here in Zuni. So now I feel part of evolutionary time scale. So I hope a practicing farmer can help. I am concerned how social theory confuses and loops the discourse. I prefer to approach solutions with a philosophy of universalism. I care about all things and all people. So what do I have to contribute? And other farmers are lifelong farmers. There's pragmatism, efficiency and effectiveness. You know, on the, the scale of maybe the political scale, the far right or the far left, uh, I am not far left. I'm a farmer. I'm, I'm pragmatic. I'm, I guess, politically left, maybe. I, uh, well, certainly, but I'm not far, far left. You know, I'm pragmatic. I, I think that farmers uh, understand what it means to mediate knowledges. One knowledge system can eclipse another if we're not careful. And I believe in hope and clarity. We we can we can bury apathy and hopelessness, and we should communicate with an ethos of truth and clarity. The and when I see petroglyphs that are random irregular lines and curves. I know them to be maps of water paths, like my great-grandfather was talking about. The ubiquitous spirals, those, as you know, represent migration and movement, the creation of villages, moving down the river, moving to another mesa or across valleys, reminds me that we can also move on from things that we don't need to be tied to 
reminds me of on, on pottery as, as as many of you know or in baskets too where there's that there's that opening of a line right where the the life of that of that vessel can come and go my my grandmother who made pottery used to always say that you should never let yourself be in a place that you can't get out of just like the the pottery design that has the opening so let's also remember the the power of language and traditional knowledge. Uh, there was a drought, as you know, I mean, there is a drought. And a couple of years ago, the main artesian spring that I was irrigating from dried up, I was, I was pretty bummed out. And I think I was in a shower or something, just kind of just thinking about stuff. And I remember, oh, you know, Grandpa talked about all those places in the valley where, where I grow. And one of them, right next to my field, like 400 feet from my field, has a, has a it's a, the word that, the, the suffix of it refers to water. The next day I went out with the post hole digger and I started digging a hole. I got about a foot down and sure enough, there was water. But language is really the, the crucible for traditional knowledge. And maybe in another conversation, we can talk about what I think is a difference between traditional ecological knowledge and just native traditional knowledge. There is a difference. I think that you know, also when I taste and assay the soil for the best cropping, I know that beans or onions taste better if they're planted over there or, or over here. And when I plant my old beans, I know those are the beans that my great-grandmothers loved. Another thing is that when I notice privilege among my own people, I know privilege happened in the past. As scholars, please take greater care in who you select as your informants. I know some good people. I have great friends that are working with you all. But some of them, they may be knowledgeable, but are they part of an elite? So create a mutually respectful relationship and debate your partners, your informants. Be brave. When it comes down to a lifelong farmer, practitioner, a practitioner, really, we are of this place. And we have a place in creating a more beautiful world. A farmer's authority and influence is not voted on or constructed. Many of these leaders, they're natural magnets, like, like the human experience ages ago of the time on the savannah when life was always on a precipice. We humans gravitated to a person with strength, experience, and practice. That special authority is not from dominance, but from approval and agreement. And this is when influence is reflection of our highest collective expression of good. I'm going to read a, a, a short piece here. It's, it's relevant, and it's called... I wrote this uh, during COVID actually, it's called Precipice and Purpose. Generations before us struggled, but people stood and they got into lines, chanted old words, conjured the beings around them and those above and below. These acts are part of a universal and dramatic plan, time-tested and appraised with terms set by nature and metaphor. We inherit metaphors from the swifts and the swallows that congregate and build homes near the springs. To always be near water makes sense. And we learn that it is practical to give space to one another, like dispersed anthills across a valley. The immaculate lives of other beings will always offer us lessons and solace. We do not sit with our ideas entirely indoors. We expose them to the natural forces of the sun, rain, and wind. We are not 
seeking an escape route. On the contrary, we are more potent than ever. We are here to defend and grow our purpose, to make things work even with so little. And we are not paralyzed with indecision. We wake in the morning and decide which foot goes in front of the other, and we move. In my most difficult times, my great-grandparents told me this. All things come from a seed. Corn, the tallest trees, birds, fish, humans, and our ideas come from seeds. All creatures breathe in and breathe out with an unseen vital force. Those creatures live all around us. They are below us, they are above us, and in all the waters of the world. Many of those creatures have wings, fins, arms, and legs that help them move from one place to another. Like us, some creatures have eyes and ears to perceive things around them. Like us, those creatures respond when the sun rises and when winter becomes spring. And like us, those creatures have power beyond their physical bodies. If we think of them, that is their power speaking to us. All things vibrate. The ground sometimes shakes. The stars move across the sky. The ground we stand on and the space above are the backbone of our sublime world. And it too has power. We respect the power. We talk to it. And with collective ritual, we help to maintain a cosmological process. This is our attunement and our knowledge. In great difficulty and worry, remember this truth. We are never alone. All the creatures of the universe are not much different than us. We are a family of beings. If we settle our nerves and into the right frame of mind, we will conjure their powers, and nothing can undo us. All people, all beings, and the vastness of the lands, water, sky, and distant galaxies are part of a collective, evolving magnificence. Like a film, our stories will play out and change, but will remain the same beautiful story. Our purpose will appear from neglected spaces, forgotten peoples, intervals of crisis and rapture, and in the pattern languages of our lives. I was looking, playing with this thing the other day. I, I made this oh, a while back. I, a good friend taught me how to make these these rings from, from yucca. And so the yucca was reminding me of a time with my grandfather one day at our field. And at the end of the day, he said, get get a bunch of onions. We're going to have beans tonight. And we always ate onions with beans. And he said, just get a lot, get a lot. And so I went out and I was pulling up the onions with a shovel, digging them up, and I was carrying them. But I kept dropping them. I was stumbling. They would drop and I and pick them up and drop. And I was trying to get back to pick up with these onions. And my grandpa approached me, pulled out his pocket knife, and he cut some yucca quickly, tied end to end, and stripped them, tied them. And he wrapped them around those onions. And I could pick them up and I carry them back to the truck. And he said, one of the most important things and first things that we need to learn to do as human beings is how to tie things together. So thank you very much for this time. And I'm happy to carry on this conversation with you right now. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jim. I'm going to turn over to Sarah, who can handle uh, questions, comments, thoughts coming in from the audience. Uh, that was everything I hoped it would be and more, Jim. It's such a pleasure to listen to you and learn from you and uh, just think about those adventures, because I think that that's something that we all need to do as human beings still to this day. Uh, really inspirational. Thanks.
so much. Sarah. Okay, so if you have questions, um, please uh, enter them in the Q&A box and we will uh, take some time here to get to those. I had a question that came in um, while you were talking about your thoughts and opinions on how um, your experiences and, and what you've learned as a lifelong farmer, how it could help other groups that are dealing with, as you mentioned, unforeseen and unknowable circumstances that are kind of happening and are going to be happening in our futures. Are there some thoughts that you could share about what you think, how other groups that are farming and dealing with these issues could um, use things that you practice and, and, and talk to about tonight? Well, I, I can help people that grow near, near me best. I mean, that's what I can do better because I know the climate, the soils, um, and those, you know, those kind of conditions better here. Just sort of aside to that, it was, it's kind of funny that I, I've been to some events where they were sort of farming events and, and somebody would say, Jim, I have this really gravelly soil and I'm trying to add some loams to it and I'm bringing in manure and doing this and that. And somebody would approach me at the same time and say, Jim, I got this really heavy clay soil and I'm trying to add sand to it and try to make it work. And, and they both in unison said, what should we do? And I said, don't plant there. <laughs> um, but that's 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 comes with some of the liberty of being in the same place for a long time, right? And and it's it's selecting a place with the right soils. So I mean, I think probably the first thing I would tell somebody is um, talk with people who grow near you, maybe down the road or in the same town. They'll know what grows, especially the older growers, the older farmers. They'll tell you, don't try tomatoes. They're not going to work. Don't waste your time. Don't try artichokes or something. Or, you know, they'll say, and what really grows where your house is at is melons and squash um, and maybe corn. And they may say, but don't even try tomatoes. Don't even try these other things. But it's best to learn from local folks, especially the local older growers. Thank you. Yeah, I I appreciate that answer. Um, here's a question about um, balance between science, knowledge, and accepting our relationships to the natural world. Um, their question is, where do you see the most hope for for our children and the world as we lead them? I well, hope. I'm glad people remember hope is an important word. Um, I think. Uh, appreciating as we were saying and talking about one of the themes here is there's just different ways of knowing but there are different knowledge systems out there there's different ways of reaching our fullest expression and some of that can be with some numbers uh, some people are really good at that some people are good at at uh, oratory some others are good at uh, maybe filmmaking and, and, and other kind of visual skills I think it's I think for the hope for for our young people is to to be open to trying many different things. I mean, that's why we go to universities because we're exposed to more universal thinking, meeting different kinds of people. I mean, it's I think my grandmother had it right when she told me to get on the road. she She wasn't kicking me out of the house. She was saying, meet other people, learn new things, be brave. Um, try new things, make mistakes. Uh, I think um, whether it's for young people to do some study abroad, perhaps uh, to challenge themselves. I'm not going to disparage anybody who wants wants their 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 kids to go to university near home, but I think there's some great value to leaving home and going somewhere very different and being on your own. Uh, and I think, yes, being open to different knowledges and try to learn across knowledge systems and that there is not one silo of knowledge or a silo of knowledge here. 
but there are many kinds of knowledges. And and I think maybe the one last thing on that matter, that point is learn how to mediate knowledges, right? Don't let one eclipse the other. Be open to that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Here is a question from a young Zuni farmer, and he is wonder or she maybe. I was wondering your advice you can give to help with situations where our Zuni seeds have been taken and sold for profit and even trademarked. How do we get our community more involved in protecting our seeds? Well, we, we keep seeds. Uh, I don't think there's much, there's really not much we can do about returning seeds that's somewhere else. And in fact, uh, in the early 90s, uh, there was a program called the Zuni Sustainable Agriculture Project. And they brought together ready experienced Zuni farmers. And when we ask them about biopiracy, about uh, removing seeds of them growing somewhere else, the Zuni farmers then said, we don't own them. Nobody owns them. So they were actually pushing back on the idea of that we should try to bring them back and that we should trademark them or anybody else should trademark them. They just said they belong to everybody. So uh, I know that might be contradictory to the way some people think now, but there is not too much we can do about that. Uh, but if you think, well, they belong to everybody. And I, I always get a kick out of my friends from Hopi that when I'm growing blue corn, they say, oh, you're growing Hopi blue corn? And I said, no, it's I'm growing it here. So now it's Zuni blue corn. Uh, so I think there's not too much we can do about that. Um, uh, I have a lot of seeds. I'm willing to share some. I know there are other farmers that have seeds. We just keep them, just keep them and keep growing them and sharing them. And if they end up in other places, that's okay. That That's just my opinion. That's just my opinion. Another question about kind of the seed, the same, similar, um, but specifically mentioning, um, I guess in the 90s, they mentioned uh, there was a Zuni waffle garden um, project. And they were wondering, that they were, I guess they were developing a seed bank of crops. And they're kind of wondering what, if you know anything about that topic, what happened with well, that? I don't think it it was. There always has been uh, those waffle gardens. And if some of you are familiar with them, you know, some people may say, what is that? Well, they're, they look like waffles. They're, <laughs> they're uh, gardens that are have uh, small walled waffle-shaped cells and they are like the inverse of a raised bed. And the idea is that you you can focus what little water there is into these little cells. So uh, typically they would be near a uh, stream or a ephemeral stream, near a well or near a spring. So there's different kinds of growing, right? There's uh, dry land fields that may be on sand overlaying clay and loam there are uh, rain-fed alluvial fans where you would plant there. There's springs um, and there are uh, oh, irrigating from dams, reservoirs. Uh, well, we don't have many of those reservoirs anymore, but, but the waffle gardens would be placed near a spring or a water source and that a person would, uh, either with buckets or... Uh, uh, ceramic, uh, get water and just and walk a short distance, a short distance to these gardens and with a ladle water each one of those cells. So water being so precious, you would have these little cells. And that is just a more efficient way of using that water. Uh, we see it, a, a version of them in, in Africa uh, but they are still here in Zuni, still, people still make them, certainly. I still make them. 
and uh, they're just an efficient way of of, of using water and it, it is one of the ways of dealing with a change in climate where it's getting drier and water is getting scarcer all the time but they're still here waffle gardens interesting thanks for clarifying that i appreciate it um yeah. And thank you everyone for putting in these great questions and we've had so many compliments your way on this talk, Jim. Um, people have really enjoyed it. Um, here is a question, kind of a comment and a question um, talking about how archaeology, as you have mentioned, um, you know, has done work and, and engaged in collaborative projects, but they haven't maybe done enough, maybe spent enough time or focus or, or resources learning from elders. Um, and um, they're asking if if you could single out one of an important one of the important topics you'd like to see studied and brought more into focus or researched in the, in the field of archaeology mm -hmm. and anthropology and archaeology. Okay, well, um, I, would, I suppose I would it could be in general. That, yeah. Okay. Well. I think first is obviously the the ethos of of research and study. I think uh, the way many in the field are not conducting research as it was done fifty years ago, and when it was not very controlled. And in fact, in the '90s, we were starting to definitely get more control over how we would engage with researchers that were from out of our communities. So things are very different now, right? Um, so we're working within those those standards, the new standards and the ethos of how you do that work. I think another thing is that there could be some frustration from, from a community. If you're going to do research, uh, make sure it's impactful for the long term, that it has uh, and it's to make a real difference. I mean, there's, I think there's a new thinking generation around this kind of research is it isn't only for curiosity shake, sakes or for a thesis or dissertation where it's done, you prove to your thesis, you gather your data, uh, all of that, you publish it, and then you go on to the next thing. Uh, I think now it's like, I think those researchers who are really public spirited and really uh, thoughtful about their work is like, let's do some collaborative work and research that's going to help this community to become more stable, uh, to, to help them flourish and do good things for the long term. So, right. So it isn't just a, okay, I proved my point. I, I, I had a theory. I, I, I tested my hypotheses. I published and then move on to the next thing. It's really like, how can this help? How can this work? And, you know, there's good scholars, good thinkers. Like, how can this work help this community thrive for the long term? Yeah, and that that ties really nicely into a question that someone asked about um, the collaborative process and that they are working towards um, engaging better and, and wondering your advice on that. And I think what you just said speaks a lot to that um, and gives. Yeah, well, collaborative, it's a, it's a, it's a buzzword like so many things. <laughs> um, I mean, there's, uh, again, not disparaging my, my friends and colleagues in the academy or a scholarship, but um, uh, yeah, you can say, uh, people used to say that, yes, I'm collaborating with Jim and I'd say, we're not collaborating. We just talked on the phone. <laughs> um, but I think a collaboration is, I would define it as a co-laboring and co-elaborating around some common idea and purpose. You know, if, if Steve and I were, were um, uh, rebuilding a, a 69 Camaro and I said, okay, I'll work on the wheels, you work on the body, uh, we both work on the engine, and we can both drive it. We both put our, our our money and our sweat into it. That's a collaboration, right? It's it's a it's a it's a mutual thing. We both co-labored on it. 
and we're going to talk about it. So we're going to co-elaborate on this this idea too. So uh, it is more; it should be more than just um, a word that we throw around. Yes, mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense, and I took note of the co-laboring. I really appreciate that term. Sometimes we need to give more context to what we say. Yeah, we, but we have to both put some something into it, right? We both have yeah. some sweat mm -hmm. equity. <laughs> well, I want to thank everyone for, for putting their comments and questions in, and I want to respect Jim's time tonight and everyone else's, and we'll wrap up. And I just want to say thank you so much again for, for joining us tonight and making this such a wonderful, wonderful cafe. It was truly enlightening and truly special. So thank you again for being here. Well, thanks to all of you, too. I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you at our next cafe. <laughs>